Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we color and as we journey through alphabetically through the United States and discuss their older crimes and criminals. Before we get to the crime, let's talk a little bit about the coloring. I have chosen a gnome stamp set today to color. I love the gnomes. This is the Simon Says Stamp Spring Gnome stamp set, and I am going to place half of a sheet of Nina Solar White Classic Crest 80 pound cardstock into my Misty stamp positioner and arrange all of the images into my Misty. This stamp set does have a number of sentiments, including some larger open font sentiments, but they didn't fit on the page, so I didn't color them. Once I have the images all placed into my Misty, I will pick them up with my the lid of my Misty and ink them up with some Copic friendly ink. I'm using Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink. And the reason I chose Copic markers to color today is because for me, I feel like in little images, I get a better um, highlight shadow ratio with Copic markers. And that's just because I use them more often. Talked about that before. I need to use my other mediums and get better at them. But for today, I went with Copics and that's where we are. I did stamp this twice because I didn't get a very good impression and I will leave the stamps in my Misty so that I can overstamp them when I am finished and send it through my scan and cut to cut out the images. I did have a couple of issues with um, overfilled markers blooping. A few weeks ago I did marker maintenance and um, kind of overfilled some of my markers. So my warm grays and my um, purples, my violets are kind of all over the page. There's a few, I mean, yeah, it was kind of a mess. Um, I am using four colors for most of the color combinations, which is going to allow me to have some nice shadows and highlights. Okay, so now that we've talked about the, co the coloring, let's jump into the crime. The next alphabetical state whose criminal past we delve into is Georgia. Georgia was granted statehood on January 2nd, 1788, becoming the 13th of the original colonies. However, Georgia was originally supposed to be the Great Utopian Society. The British colony of Georgia was founded by James Oglethorpe on February 12th, 1733, under a charter issued by and named for King George II. Known as the Oglethorpe Plan, this utopia envisioned an agricultural society of farmers and prohibited slavery. Yeah, chew on that for just a minute. Georgia was supposed to prohibit slavery. The colony was temporarily invaded by the Spanish in 1742 after the government failed to renew subsidies that helped support the, the colony. All right, so the Providence of Georgia or the province, rather, of Georgia, was one of the 13 colonies that revolted against British rule in the American Revolution. Um, the delegates from Georgia signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Georgia's first, first state constitution was ratified in February of 70, 1777. Sorry, words are hard. Georgia was the 10th state to ratify the Articles of Confederation in July of 1778 and was the fourth state to ratify the state's constitution on January 2nd, 1788. In early 1861, Georgia joined the Confederacy with secessionists having a slight majority of delegates and became a major theater of the Civil War. However, not only was the Civil War and slavery the only controversy in Georgia's history, our story today deals with religious and political intrigue and, of course, murder, murder of the state's first post-British governor. John Adams Trutland was actually born Hans Adams Trutland on January 16, 1734. His parents were Hans Michael Trutland, who was a coppersmith, and Magdalena Clara. He was born in Kermbach, Germany. His parents were married in 1731 after their first two children were born. Not super common then. John was the second of his, of his parents' children born after their marriage. Magdalena was Han, Hans Michael's second wife. His first wife was Maria Regina, with whom he had seven children. Maria died in 1727. So sometime after Maria, um, Maria died, Hans and Magdalena got together, had a couple kids, got married, and had some more children. While most of the family were Protestants, John's mother Magdalena was a Catholic, and the Tritlins were very likely persecuted by the Protestant establishment in Germany. 
the, um, this situation is probably what caused a 56 year old Hans Michael to decide in April of 1744 to take his wife Magdalena and four of their children on a dangerous voyage and seek a new life in America. The names of the four children who went on this voyage were Frederick, who was from Hans Michael's first marriage, also Hans Philip, his oldest son from Clara, and John Adams and Jonathan, who were two of his younger children um, through his um, wife, Magdalena. Sorry, my brain just jumped trails there. They traveled first to Gosport in the southern coast of Britain, and during the voyage, John's father, Hans, died. In August of 1745, his mother and brother took their family and headed toward Georgia. In Georgia, General James Oglethorpe offered refugee to anybody being persecuted. And upon their arrival in Georgia, the Trutlands were then indentured to a man named Michael Burkhalter in Vernonburg, which is about 10 miles south of present-day Savannah. In this town, they met a man, a pastor named Johann, Johann Martin Boltzus. And he noticed how talented John was and actually enrolled him in the school in Ebenezer. Um, overcoming the stigma of his parents' past, you know, going from um, a mixed religious family and the persecution and the indentured servitude, he actually became um, quite he did quite well in school. Um, it was noted that he was um, broadly educated. He, he studied hard and he learned a lot. In 1756, John married a woman named Marguerite Dupuy, who was an orphan who had also been educated in the city of Ebenezer. Um, after his marriage, he began acquiring land and established a, lar a large plantation and was a, was a successful merchant businessman. In 1768, John entered politics, serving as the Justice of the Peace. He then became the Commissioner and Surveyor of Roads. He served several terms in the Georgia House of Assembly. He was also a member of the Provincial Congress in 1775 and was instrumental member of the committee that helped draft Georgia's first constitution. So John has gone from political persecution in Germany to having his father die on their journey. They arrive in the new United States and become indentured servants, um, assumedly because they were um, poor and his mother did not have a way of providing for them. John also assumed an active role in the religious life in Ebenezer. At this time, there were sometimes violent conflicts between two major fractions, one who was led by Reverend Christoph Tri Tri Tribner, Tribner and Reverend Christian Ravenhorst. John became a leader in the Ravenhorst faction in the community. Ravenhorst accepted the many differences among the people in the colonies as a result of the different countries and cultures from which these people came. In their practical day-to-day -day activities of ministering to this diverse population, ministers like Ravenhorst found it most effective to use many different ways of converting people to their particular side of the religious quote argument quote yeah um, john's religious views formed by his association with ravenhorst helped him to develop his support for those democratic political institutions that seemed to include or be based on the idea of diversity in July of 1775, John represented Ebenezer at the Georgia Provincial Congress. He took an active role in the American Revolution, quickly becoming a leader of the radical faction. In February of 1777, John was on the drafting committee of Georgia's first constitution. On May 8, 1777, the immensely popular John was elected by a wide margin as Georgia's first governor under the new constitution. One man, a clergyman named Henry Mullenberg, called Jan John a man of, quote, native intelligence, who he had a reputation of being able to reply very coolly and logically to his political opponents and was therefore well suited for a difficult task of leading the new state of Georgia. 
So John's term as a governor was marked by political conflicts between the radical and conservative factions of the Patriots. The conservatives opposed the democratic provision of the new constitution, which allowed many of those from lower classes, like the former indentured servant John, to be elected to positions of power in the government. The radicals referred to the conservatives as Tories, you know, meaning they were um, British, <laughs> which, you know, post-revolutionary war was, you know, a big insult, I suppose. <laughs> The radicals and conservatives clashed over the issues of civil control of the military, the conduct of the war, and the conservatives' initiative to merge Georgia with South Carolina. There was some attempt to make them into one state, probably because South Carolina was more conservatively led at the time. The radicals were defeated in their attempts to remove the conservative General McIntosh from his position of leadership in the Continental Army in Georgia. And this was going on at the same time that people like George Washington were siding with McIntosh. So there was a little bit of a political, a lot of political unrest throughout John's um, political life. Throughout the war, these political conflicts erupted into violent and tragic conf confrontations. In February of 1777, the conservative Joseph Habersham killed a radical Lieutenant Nathaniel Hughes um, in a dispute at the opening of a convention called to write Georgia's first constitution. In, on May 16, 1777, um, McIntosh was mortally wounded, or uh, rather, sorry, McIntosh wounded, mortally wounded, a radical um, man whose last name was Gwinnett. In February of 1780, the conservative, a conservative man named James Jackson killed a man named Wells. So there's lots of political upheaval and there's lots of dying. I mean, our politics now are not necessarily pretty, but man, there's a lot of killing of people going on here. The Revolutionary War was particularly hard on the religious groups in Ebenezer. Both British and American soldiers plundered the, commu plundered the community as many as 10 times over the course of the war. So depending on who was actually in the stronghold, the other side would come and plunder it, and it just kind of went back and forth. On December 30th, 1776, the Reverend Ravenhorse died, leaving the city of Ebenezer with no spiritual leader. So when John Houston was elected governor in January of 1778, John dropped out of state politics and returned to Ebenezer to help the community and the people who have provided him with so much during his three decades in America. Sorry, there's lots of people with the same name here. So the next governor was also named John. Okay, just so we're tracking here. But John Trutlin now um, has left the political arena and headed back to the religious um, area. In late 1871, John then re-entered state politics as Ebenezer's elective representative to the Georgia legislature. He served in the 1782 session and was one of the few radical Democrats in the government that year. And the imbalance of power between the radicals and the conservatives helped create an atmosphere in which the conservatives felt free to seek revenge for old, quote, wrongs. Um, so during John's political tenure, he dealt with clashes between radical and conservative um, politics. He dealt with clashes between radical and conservative conservative um, religious fractions. He conducted business during the war and he thwarted South Carolina's effort to annex Georgia. So he had kind of a busy political career. In 1779, however, John moved to Orangeburg in South Carolina, where he was elected to South Carolina's assembly and held that position until 1782. Okay. So he kind of jumped ship. He left Georgia, went to South Carolina, was elected um, into another position there. Now, I did not do a lot of research on his um, political and religious 
work in South Carolina because we're talking about Georgia today, not South Carolina. However, on March, on an, a, a night in March 1782, let's start this sentence properly. By some accounts, at least five men rode up to the Trutland home. They demanded for John to come outside, but he refused. The men then set fire to his home, forcing John and his wife and children to come outside. The Trutland home was set on fire, and John was brutally murdered in full view of his family. Okay, so here's where the intrigue comes into play. The legend says that a group of, quote, Tories killed him. So political conservatives or, you know, British ideologists killed him. However, there is another theory that a jilted suitor may have attacked him because just days before his death, John Trutland had married for the third time. So there is some speculation that um, he was a bit of a rogue and that his death was um, payback for maybe not being as nice to the ladies as he should have been. <laughs> See, this intrigue just follows this man everywhere he goes. And here's another part of that. It is uncertain where he is actually buried. This video could have been so much longer if I had spent any amount of time talking about the personal side of his life. I mean, he was on his third wife right before he died, and that seemed to have been maybe justification for his murder. I don't know. I felt like we were already had enough details for the story. We were going <laughs> short and sweet. Um, that could be a whole nother story, though. I did find a photograph of the land grant he was awarded after his time as an indentured servant. And here's a photograph of John Adam. I hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel today. I have added a couple of other videos here I think you would enjoy, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not already subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did so. I love to see comments. Um, give me a thumbs up. Let me know what you liked and what you didn't like. And I hope you have a really fabulous